Holy smokes. Woo! What a season. Thanks, Amazon and insane billionaire Jeff Beezies for picking up this show after it was cancelled by the scum-sucking pig dogs at Sci-Fi. <laughs> anyway, enough of that, Smeg. Let's get right to it. Season 4 of The Expanse is based mostly around the fourth book in the series, Cibola Burn, which came out in 2014, and an Expanse novella which features Bobby the Babe, Gods of Risk, which came out in 2012. Towards the end of the season, we get a little crossover from Book 5, or at least a bit of Book 5, in The Expanse series, Nemesis Games, which I'm sure will be the main inspiration for Season 5, but more on that in a bit. This season was a little more chill than the previous, as in the action and political stuff was just as intense as ever, but it was more rounded and less epic than what we have seen in the past, but I reckon this is a good thing, a fresh change, and trust me, if they continue to follow the books as closely as they have, season 5 is gonna be fucking intense. So even though some book readers, and I'm sure now TV show fans, have complained that the fourth book was a bit dull and didn't progress the main story and the proto-molecule and the aliens and blah blah blah, I have to disagree. I think you need to take deep breaths sometimes in order to prepare for and set up future epic moments. This season has focused on some pretty minor events I guess you could say but has laid in place the foundations for insane future events to come but more on that in a bit. Despite being a little more low key as usual there are multiple arcs going on in the season so I will break them down into four main storylines and explain how they all tie together while trying to avoid book and future spoilers. I mean there will be book spoilers from book four but not future spoilers so sorry if you want to know everything that's going to come up in its entirety including likely upcoming events but too bad this will be more of a breakdown than a spoiler spoiler heavy video but like you could always just read the books they are short and easily digestible and also flip it awesome man but anyway spoilers for four seasons of the expanse and four books oh and this will likely be a big old fatty boo baddy of a video so i have timestamps in the description if you want to jump to anything specifically the four arcs are as follows Arc 1, the Rossi Gang. This includes Holden, Alex, Amos, and Naomi on Illus, Miller and the Proto-Molecule stuff, ancient structures on Illus, tension between the Belter colonists and inner factions, and Mertry and his ambitions, what he's really up to. Arc 2 is Ava Sorella's political campaign. So it's Ava Sorella versus Nancy Gao, the Inner's blockade at the Soul Gate, and New World Exploration debates. Arc 3 is Bobby and the Mafia. This includes Mars Economic Recession, Bobby joining a criminal faction to make ends meet, Mars military and police corruption, Mars illegal cooperation with militant OPA members. Arc 4 is the Ashford and Drama arc versus Marco Inares, who we'll talk about in a bit. This also includes the introduction of political idealist and radical Marco, drama conflict with Fred Johnson, Ashford's hunt for Marco, and Marco's future terrorist plans, which is like pretty fucking epic if you've read the book. So stick around for a little bit of a little bit of sizzle there. Arc 1. In the books, it's been about two and a half years since the gates were opened to Holden and the gang land on Illus. We can assume it's been about that long in the show, as even though there are portals to other galaxies and spaceships that can travel much faster than what we have now, there is no real FDL travel as in faster than light other than the gates, which are technically FDL. But the ships still have to fly through open space. They don't have a warp drive or anything. So yeah, it takes time to travel from Earth, Mars, or the belt, to the Sol Ring, to the Medina Station in the Magic Bubble, then from there to another system and so on. In fact, the book says it takes a year and a half to get from the Medina Station to Illus. So we can assume that in the show, it takes a long time too. And thus, even within this one season, perhaps over a year has passed within the few episodes from when Holden first gets the message from Avasarella to when he lands on Illus. perhaps a year has passed perhaps not I can't quite remember in the books it definitely has though regardless it does take time to set up a colony and so on so we can assume that it's been at least two years since the last season so Holden is sent to Illus to investigate possible proto-molecule behavior you see Avasarella is skeptical that these new worlds will provide humanity all of humanity with new homes as whatever species used to occupy these planets is long dead they're wiped out out. there's nothing there they're just blank planets but there's evidence that something was there previously something killed them something that might reappear and it's not just the proto molecule aliens either they done gone got killed too so something much worse fucked them all up so yeah on top of that this alien technology that we know turns people into gross mutations and there was an ancient war between two super advanced species and it appears one or both 
were obliterated, so it makes sense to travel with extreme cautions to these new planets, and perhaps research teams and time is needed before we start sending colonists. This is Avicerella's line of thought, but not everyone agrees, such as her former subordinate turned political rival Nancy Jude. I mean Nancy Gu. Gal. I don't know how to pronounce names, leave me alone, but more on that in a bit. A UN blockade has been set up at the Soul Gate to stop civilians from traveling to these new planets, which many find an affront. Why can't refugees and colonists travel at their own volition to these new habitable worlds? The Belters and Outer Colonies, and even the Martians, and even some Earthers find this to be yet another form of oppression from those higher up. Fucking government. Regardless, prior to the blockade, a few colony ships snuck through the ring and set up base. Some of those landed of Illus, which are the Belters we meet in the first few episodes. The main political drive, the reason Illus is so sought after, is that it's full of lithium a highly valuable element that is the new colonist's main source of income. But as you can imagine, large corporations are also interested in a planet rich in this element, and thus a big fuck-off corporation, the Royal Charter Energy, send a team led by the savage Adolphus Mertry to also investigate the planet. But his real motives are to rid the Belters of the wealthy planet so the company can take over and make billions of dollars, to which he has a small stake in. I think he's getting he's going to get 1% of the profits, which when you talking billions upon billions of dollars is quite a lot, but more on that in a bit. The problem is, as Mertry's team arrives, their ship gets fucking fucked up, and at first we believe it to be an attack from the ground, from the settlers, but then this ancient tech attacks with these little drone things, and so we assume it could be those, but it's pretty obvious, as there's so much animosity between the Inners and the Belters, that it's likely, you know, what else is new? It's pretty much assumed that the Belters were responsible for the attack on Mertry and his crew. This is more or less confirmed when Amos and Mertry discuss discover pardon of an explosive, a detonator, at the crash site. And later, it's confirmed through flashbacks and conversations that yes, a group of settlers were afraid that the Inners were coming to take what they believe was rightfully theirs, and so they planned an attack. At first, they were just meant to blow up the landing platform to buy some time to deter future colonists. But as Mertry's ship arrived early, they were caught off guard in the explosion, which killed a whole bunch of Mertry's mates. Now look, I get that we're meant to hate Mertry. He's one of those characters that's set up so that the audience hates him, and yes, he turns out to be quite the dick. But initially, his actions are fairly justified, if you ask me anyway. Perhaps not mowing down that dude in cold blood, though he was outnumbered and they were threatening him. But anyway, perhaps that was a bit much. And it turns out the settlers did kill a whole bunch of his crew, most of whom were innocent travelers, doctors, scientists, and so on. Also, also, they were planning on killing the rest of them as well. So yeah, from my perspective, and definitely from Mertry's perspective, his motives, his reactions are somewhat justifiable. But then I guess, like, he was there to secretly remove the settlers all along and, and he's obviously a little bit psychopathic and he uses his power to justify his, his I don't know sadism I suppose though not necessarily he wasn't there to necessarily remove them through violent means just to get rid of them in any way I suppose but regardless he was more or less sent there to deal with them one way or another be it genocide or eviction but regardless regardless the settlers did strike first so I don't know man he is a dick but is he justified probably not but still I don't know I think from his perspective it's like you know they killed all his buddies, man. So one of Mertry's crew, Chandra, starts boning Amos. And I mean, can you blame her? Look at this fucking jacked mofo. Hell, I'd bone him and I'm not even into dudes. Or am I? This creates a little conflict in my own mind and also between the gangs, which ultimately end in Amos having to mow her down. Classic Amos. So to cut things short, let's jump right to the end of Arc 1. The planet is totally riddled with protomolecule alien technology and is starting to wake up since Ghost Miller and Holden started messing with it. This freezes the orbiting ships by disabling their fusion drives, similar to what happened inside the bubble last season, except this time they are in a decaying orbit. And so unless Holden and Miller can shut down the shit on the planet, it's very likely one or both ships orbiting Illus will crash and burn. Super advanced tech that makes no sense to our space monkeys is kind of a running theme in this show. Let's not worry about the physics too much. So let's talk about Miller. After the Eros incident, the human Miller was killed, but the proto-alien tech created an AI program that took the form of Miller and is only visible to Holden. This we know. Although he is often referred to as Ghost Miller, it's important to remember that he is not a ghost of Miller. Miller is dead. He is an artificial intelligence created by the proto-molecule aliens programmed to investigate. He takes the form of Miller 
Tyler and is visible only to Holden. His connection is being maintained by a tiny piece of proto goo that is hidden in the cargo bay of the Rosinante. Somehow, over time, Ghost Miller has gained sentience, like before he was apparently just a blip in Holden's head, acting as a puppet AI for his former masters, the proto alien. But over time, he has seemingly gained sentience and is fighting against his puppet masters. So Ghost Miller has been begging Holden to take him to Illus because apparently there is a dormant weapon on the planet, a magic bullet that killed or disabled the proto aliens or is capable of. An off switch, Ghost Miller is haunted by the pain and fear of all those that died on Eros and so he is therefore selfish but perhaps justifiable reason. He wants to end his own existence and this is the only way he knows how. So Miller and Holden need to fix this shit all the while a local parasite starts infecting everyone which is causing rapid onset blindness. Holden however is immune due to his anti-cancer medication. Remember how in season 1 he got blasted with radiation? Now he is on a whole bunch of meds which coincidentally makes him immune to the parasite. So he and Miller fuck around in the ancient constructs which are apparently well over a billion years old which is crazy if you think about it. During which time Miller disappears and a massive bomb detonates on the other side of the planet. This bomb, probably caused by Miller, causes a shockwave followed by a tsunami which means the settlement will be wiped out in a matter of hours. So the gang must put aside their differences and hide in the ancient structure which they believe will be strong enough to withstand the, the blast wave and the tsunami. They did plan on a space base evacuation but as the Belters saw this as just another excuse to rid the planet of them and also the ships in orbit are disabled by the prototech hiding out in the ancient and strong alien structure seems like the only viable option. However the bombs and water and so on also brought forward a local species of snot slugs that have a neurotoxin that fucks everyone up real good. One touch and the slugs will kill you dead. Kind of a bummer. Anyway Holden and one of the doctors discovers the key to Holden's immunity for, for the blindness and cure for the blindness is concocted. There is however no cure for the slugs poison though so they must be avoided at all costs. Typically they're burnt or stomped on. Miller and Holden travel deep within the structure and find a giant off switch that is some super advanced tech left behind by the aliens who fought the proto molecule aliens back in the day billions of years ago. Ghost Miller jumps into a robot and is now able to project his voice which can be heard by Dr. LV who followed them. This proves that Miller was real and not just in Holden's head whom we as the audience already knew but it's really nice now that other people know that as well. The station's defenses however attack Miller. The proto alien or Miller's former masters have been trying to shut Miller down for ages as his AI has gone rogue. This is why Miller is all glitchy. The proto aliens are trying to rein him in and he has been fighting it as best he can. Anyway, Miller, aided by Dr. LV, manages to jump through the off switch. We don't really know how it works, but Miller told us it wipes out all proto tech that it touches, including himself, as he is just proto alien tech. So Ghost Miller dies, but he shuts down all the tech on the planet in doing so, which releases the ships in orbit and everyone lives happily ever after. Except for Chandra, who was killed by Amos and a whole bunch of settlers in the inners who were killed by each other and the storm or the slugs. But you know, all the cool people live. As mentioned, the proto tech is disabled and thus the ship's fusion drives come back on which saves them from their deathly decay. This is awesome because the Belter settlers have a ton of lithium on the ship and if the ship were to be destroyed they would lose hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars perhaps of lithium which they were going to sell or trade for supplies to keep their colony afloat. Without it they would surely die on the planet or be forced to leave. So this is a win for the settlers who make a shit ton of money and get to stay on the planet laying claim to it and getting very rich in the meantime. This chick, Lucia, was one of the conspirators who blew up Mertry's ship. She didn't want to hurt anyone, just deter them, but shit happened and now she would surely be tried and punished for her mistake. I mean, it, it more or less was an act of terrorism. But Holden and Naomi think she deserves a second chance. So in his report, Holden will say that she was killed during these events, lost to space despite Naomi's best efforts to save her. A white lie, I suppose. Amos gets some new fingers and gets to test them out on Mertry's dumb face. Fuck this guy, scared. I mean, imagine being locked in a room with this dude. Blah, that's that's truly spooky stuff. So Mertry gets his ass fed to him and is going back to Earth to face trial for his very naughty behavior. Holden finds the proto goo, which Miller told him about before he died, and fires it into a star, giving a final farewell and send off to Miller. 
And that pretty much ends arc one. The only dude who didn't really have much of a story was Alex, though he did save the ships and buy them some time with his awesome spaceship skills. Uh, but his overall arc this season was pretty non-consequential. But you know, he's still brilliant as always. Arc two focuses on Avasarala and her political campaign. While all the shit on Illus is going on, Avasarala gets a political rival who wants to allow civilian travel through the gates and onto new worlds. Avasarala wants caution. Thus a rivalry is born and Avasarala ends up losing to her former subordinate. Not much needs to be spelled out here in too much detail. The major point is that Avasarala is no longer the head of Earth. She hopes she is wrong and that travel to new worlds will be chill, but she's not convinced. There will be more on this in later seasons for sure. Also, due to the blockade, a number of ships have been lining up, waiting for the go-ahead to head through the gate. These ships are full of supplies and are basically sitting ducks for pirates and raiders, but more on that in a bit. Arc 3. While all this is going on, a third story is taking place. One that involves the beautiful Bobby. You see, after all the rings opened, exposing a bunch of habitable planets, that which have breathable air, plant life, drinkable water, a flippin' atmosphere, the Mars mission, that is Mars's terraforming program, to many, seems like a waste of time now. Why spend all your time and effort creating an atmosphere on Mars? Why waste generations on a project that only those in a hundred years will be able to appreciate, when one can simply get in a metal box, travel for a year or two, and end up on an uninhabited planet that is already suitable for life and colonization. Seems like a waste of time and money converting Mars into this thing that already exists thousands of times over, right? Because of this, Mars, as they say, is not the same as it used to be. People are leaving. The best and brightest are fucking off to join the queue to get onto one of these planets and abandoning their home planet. This is causing economic turmoil on Mars. Remember, Mars was once a stable and advanced force to be reckoned with due to their technological innovation and military might. Now, with so many fleeing to these new worlds, or at least joining a queue in order to be the first or one of the first to get to a new planet once the blockade is lifted, the planet Mars is going through a massive economic downturn, making work scarce and the future of Mars grim. So then what the fuck has Bobby been fighting for all her life? She is conflicted because everything she has sacrificed, all the lives of her friends and comrades have been for the future of Mars, a dream that is now likely never to come true. She is lost and she is poor. She ends up being blackmailed by corrupt officials and tricked into working for them, but then soon she embraces it. The money is good and as long as she is not stealing weapons or things that can harm others, just leftover scraps, she is morally okay with it. That is until she gets suspicious of this military dude who is still weapons and sets them up for an ambush. Sorry, they set her criminals up for an ambush. Now, I can't talk too much about this without ruining season five, but basically corrupt officials are selling military equipment and weapons to a wild OPA or Belter faction led by Marco Inaris, a radical Belter terrorist. Bobby the Babe ends up in the middle of this and that's where all this shit they have been stealing has been going to what will be known as the Free Navy, a radical militant group of Belters who oppose the truce between the Inners and the Outers led by Marco. Poor Bobby, she's just a lost bad motherfucker who needs a hug. Anyway, this brings us to Ark 4. The Ashford and Drummer stuff. So Marco is the former lover of Naomi. Remember, a few seasons back, Naomi mentioned she had a son, Philip. That was the kid she made with Marco. Naomi also admits she used to be a Terry and was part of the attack on Luna that killed over 500 people. She couldn't live that life anymore, which is when she left Marco and her son. A few years later or so, she met Holden. But now her son and Marco are super naughty and they have big, big plans. So Drummer gets mad at Fred and quits her position at the head of the Medina station. Ashford refuses to take her place as he has a mission, one last mission in his mind, to track down and kill Marco Inaris before he breaks the peace by committing more heinous crimes. This is where arcs 3 and 4 come together. Marco was the real dude behind the corruption on Mars, in one way or another. It is he who has been stealing or buying stealth equipment from Mars for his upcoming war. He calls it a war, but really it's just going to be a bunch of terrorist attacks, at least that's what he has planned. He has stolen Martian stealth paint and covered a whole bunch of asteroids in it. He then has them launched at Earth, but not before Ashford finds him. Despite being a total bad motherfucker, Ashford is defeated and executed by Marco and his son, Philip. And that really sucks, as I love this character. But alas, he died. Then Marco launches his attack, not on the Belter Station, as Ashford had thought, but at Earth. The asteroids covered in Martian stealth tech will be undetectable to Earth before it's too late. They will crash into Earth, wreaking havoc all over the planet. Billions will die, and there is nothing Earth or anyone else will be able to do about it. Or 
or will they? I believe this will be the main focus of season five. So until then, I guess we will just have to wait to see what happens. Man, that's pretty much it. I could go into much more finer detail, but I think I have waffled on long enough. Although this season was a little more low key, it really has set up the show for some epic major events to come. Trust me, if they do what happens in book five, season five will be a fucking riot. If you have any questions, please leave a comment and I will answer them as best I can. Though I refuse to allow major plot spoilers, so don't bother. I won't spoil upcoming events, I, is what I mean. If you really want to know what happens, just read the books, you lazy dogs. Or at least read the synopsis on Wikipedia or something. Personally, I think the Experience is the best sci-fi on TV currently. It's been the best for years, man. It totally rocks, and despite being cancelled by one network, these fuckheads, then picked up by another, these legends, you wouldn't even tell. It looks and feels the same as ever. The cast and crew are excellent, the cinematography and VFX are stellar, the music is dope, it's just great and I love it. I'm in love with it. Hey, if you're in love with The Expanse, leave a comment and let's get a friendly discussion going. Like, subscribe and all that shit too if, if, if you want, that'd be cool. And if you want to see more of me and my dumb face, check out my second channel. It's pretty new and small at this stage, but it's a lot of fun. It's an Australian-centric comedy channel about fishing, hunting, camping, gardening, travel stories, tool maintenance, cooking, like lots of cooking, chili peppers, and just funny skits with good old Australian hillbilly shenanigans. So check it out if that's your thing. Otherwise, have a very, very nice day. Lots of love, Jake.